I will request Pastor Liz to pray for Pasi. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple that as the word goes forth, it becomes a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. As your word goes forth through Reverend Tom, you sent your word and heal us and deliver us from all our distractions. As your word goes forth, it becomes in the beginning. It becomes a beginning for someone. And that word is with God, and that word is God. And the same word is with God in the beginning. Thank you that today, as the word comes forth, it becomes a beginning for someone. Thank you for your word. Order our steps in your word. Thank you for Reverend Tom as he ministers your word. It shall not return to you void of power, but it shall accomplish and prosper in the thing you sent it to. Thank you, because we are the thing you are sending your word to. So your word prospers in us and through us. We bless you and we give you honor and glory for miracles, signs, and wonders that always accompany your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Please be seated. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Jogush. And thank you, Pastor Liz. And thank you, Eunice. Thank you, for, thank you to the leadership of this house for the invitation. May God continue to prosper you and bless you. Amen. <coughs> Let me begin where I should begin, just to say you know my name, you've heard my name. Uh, for the sake of those who are not here last week, uh, let me do an appropriate introduction that I'm married to Susan Wajiko Aotieno. In the last uh, almost 20, going 20 years, 19 going 20 years. I'm a father of four children, uh, two girls, Shekina is 16 and Shama is 14. And then uh, two boys, Dawood is 11 and Shalom is three. So I'm a father of four, two girls and two boys. And uh, I'm a priest in the Anglican Church by the grace of God uh, for the last 21 years that I've been a priest. Currently serving at ACK St. Augustine Church, Madaraka. Yeah, so you can hear some Madarakans here. <laughs> um, yep, God bless you for receiving the word of God last week and also coming with a ready heart. You have a ready heart? All right, we're going to receive, but we're going to begin by answering a question that was raised by one of you. And I did raise the matter last week and said you can forgive God. And um, one of the things that I knew it would do is that it would jolt people. It's like, wow, what's that? So we grow up with expectations. And the first thing I'd like to say is that our philosophies of life as human beings are defined by what we call humanistic philosophy. All right? Let me tell you what a humanistic philosophy sounds like. A good person is good because they do good things. Okay? That's a humanistic philosophy. Now, that up to that point, there's nothing wrong with what you have said. The only trouble now is when you transfer that to God. That God is good because he does only good things. Then you have a problem. Because there are times God doesn't do good things. And also there are times he doesn't allow good things to happen to us. Does he remain good? Yes, he does. Because God's goodness is in his character, not his works. And you need to understand that goodness is a description of God's character. Not works. In his works, he will let you go through trouble. He will cause you trouble. He will wound you. But he doesn't wound you. And I want you to make a difference. Take a difference between, or make the difference between hurt and harm. In Psalm 121, the psalmist says, the Lord will shield you from harm. It doesn't say the Lord will shield you from hurt. Let me, 
tell you the difference between heart and harm. Heart is when you go through pain. Harm is when you go through destruction. And that's the difference. So the Lord will cause you to go through pain, but he will not let it harm you. But it will hurt you. Understand? Now, when God causes us injury, we get injured. That sounds like a redundant statement. Because when God causes you injury, he will not shield that injury from hurting you. It will injure you. Okay? When it does injure you, if you don't deal with it as you should, you will have issues with God. For that reason, some people have walked away from the faith. And they have said, I can't serve a God who allows my dad to suffer the way he has. I can't serve a God who let my mom die. I can't serve a God who allowed me to watch my brother get shot and killed. Am I making some sense? And so when you go through healing, you must necessarily understand that there are some wounds that you're going to be dealing with that are divine wounds. Please understand that. And that you and I are not immune from God's wounding. I need to walk you carefully through this because we apply humanistic philosophy when we are dealing with God. And that's what gets us into, into trouble. So we say God is good, is good all the time. A lot of people understand that statement to mean God is good and is good all the time. And when good things are happening to me, God is good. And when bad things are happening to me, Satan is happening to me. Not all the time. Sometimes when bad things is happening to you, God is really happening on you. Oh, yeah. And he is testing. Tell your neighbor, testing. Through trials. And trials have the same pain like temptations. The point is the same. Hallelujah. The point, you will hurt just the same as when Satan oppresses you. The only thing you need to know is from whose hand is this coming from? If it is coming from the hand of God, it is the same hand that heals. And it's the same hand that will wound you. Do, do we have the guys on the screen? Okay. You can search our scriptures uh, quickly. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Please put it up. Preferably in the ESV. Preferably. Or NIV. Okay. So um, let, me, let me just suspend this fast. Eh? Let's, I'm going to get through this. So just don't show it fast. Go to the scripture. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Have you found it? Because I want us all to read it together. If you can find it, then we will we'll understand a few things that we are trying to say today. And um, oh, okay, let's read it together. Uh huh. See now that I alone am He. There is no God but me. I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. No one can rescue anyone from my hand. So does God cause pain? But does he harm you with his pain? He doesn't harm you. Does he hurt you with his pain? He does. He hurts you. But his intention is never to harm you. Are we together? All right. Same Person, go, please go to Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. So this is God testifying about himself, okay? Now let's hear the testimony of God's character from a prophet. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Okay, let's, let's go together. Come, let us return to the Lord. For he has torn us and he will heal us. He has wounded us and he will bind up us. Need I continue? There's so many scriptures that say that God can wound you. And he 
he does not cease to be good when he wants to. No. You may not understand his hand, but his heart is always committed to you. His hand may seem heavy on you, but his heart will never depart from you. When the Bible says that God is faithful, it's a statement of his character. He is faithful, and that's why he says in Isaiah 43, when you go through the fire, not if, I will be with you. When you go through the waters, they will not drown you, for I am with you. When? Not if. When? It's a matter of circumstance. When God causes you harm. Rather, heart, not harm. Heart, when he hurts you. And when God prepares to use you, my friend, he will hurt you. You will need to forgive him a lot. Ha. I can tell you, I'm not here talking about healing because I wanted to. I'm here talking about healing because if I'm to give you the testimony of my life, God wounded me. He wounded me deeply. Some of which I never thought I would recover from. And some of which I would never have been able to talk about unless he perfected the kind of depth of healing that I teach you here about. So I don't teach you theory. I teach you what God has graciously allowed me to go through. Amen. Aya, tumemaliza hiyo swali. I know you want it to be the sermon. It will not be a sermon today. <laughs> I was just answering a question. Amen? Yeah. So, do we need to forgive God? Now you know why. Yes, we need to forgive God because he lets down your expectation and mine. Your expectation and mine is that he will always, oh, he will be there for us. There will be time, my friend, you will cry. And you say, God, where are you? Nasikia katu echo kutoka kauko juu dum 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 dum. Kila kitu ina echo na uski God. Did he leave? No. Is he quiet? Yes. Do you feel him? No. Is he there? now because God is mysterious and we access him by faith not feeling we access him by faith not logic praise the Lord Hebrews 11 verse 6 without faith it's impossible to please God for whoever believes in him must know that he is that's not a statement of logic or feeling. It's a statement of faith. He is. kuna full stop up. Then like a comma. And is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. He is. Yani yeye ni yeye. Vile alisema vile yeye yuko ndio yule yule. Vile yuko. He is. That's how he's accessed. I may not feel you, but I know you are here. I may not think my logical processes, my log frame may have been completely interfered with. By now I can't feel A, B, C, D, but I know you are here with me. Amen. Okay, let me move on because my time is not static. And I have a lot to cover. So now let me go to, let's go to that Two last slides that I didn't cover, and I, I have important things to say from those two last slides from last week. Do you have that? They're the last two slides uh, from last week's sermon. Then I'll make the reading. <laughs> Good Anglicans have to make the reading. <laughs> so I'll make the reading <laughs> of the day. And we will go into something really that I began to talk about last week, and I realized, hey, kuna vile ni mapoteza wa se. So I want to clarify a few things today. Amen. So, last two slides. Why some are not healed? There's one before that. The steps to healing. Remember that? That's the one before. Yeah, go to number one of that. Um, so, number one of that, so that's number six. So, go to number one, which is the previous slide. Yes, there. 
So we said, and just say it with me, number one is what? Very important for you to do that. And remember we said we are wounded, we are spirit, soul, and body. We said that the spirit is what? Torn. That's why I say it's crushed. Proverbs 18, 14, a crushed spirit, who can bear? The, 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 the soul is what? Broken. Okay? And the body is what? Is ease. Or is ailing. So healing does three things. It does what? Cures. It's curing that which is ailing. He said, which is what? Mending that which is and then repairing that which is torn. So healing is a very encompassing thing. So acknowledge your own. Number two, very important, that forgiveness is not a talent. There's nothing like I can't forgive. There's something like I can't sing. Eh? Yeah, guys who are born, uh, bathroom singers, when they sing, they need to be alone. I need to be alone. You, you, you cannot stand their <laughs> cacophony. <laughs> but at least you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then, then, then there are those guys who can sing. Now, forgiveness is not like that. There is no such thing as people who can forgive and people who forgive and forgiveness is a choice. Number, th number three, to release is to let go. There comes a point, good people, where you have to say, Ikitu, nimeyacha. You owe me so much. If I start kukudai, eh, I'll get so hurt and so offended. Nakuacha. And not nakuacha ile, uh, I'll not talk to you, I'll not take your calls, I'll not look for you. I'll not. That's revenge. Remember last week we said, vengeance is sweet. Do you remember that? Vengeance is sweet. We really like it when we are exacting. You know, vengeance is exacted. We are exacting. And we make that statement in our hearts. Hello? We make it where? So, I realize this moja will change. I will <laughs> Why? You made an inner vow, a strong determination in your heart to close your heart to this person. So your spirit can never receive anything from them. Yeah. Right? Choose to release. Number four, to repent is to change the mind that leads you to you changing your heart and changing your action. The Greek word is metanoia. There are two words there. Meta, which is to change. Noia is knows, which is the mind. So metanoia is to change the mind. Which leads to a change of heart and change of behavior. So repentance is change. You cannot say, I've repented, Lord, concerning this, this person, and I don't want to see them again. I could not repent Number six. I'm just going through this because I prepared it last week and we didn't get enough time. Ask God to fill you with this, with his love. Then choose to become a vessel of reconciliation. Make restitution. Restitution is the total fullness of, of, of restoration. There is restoration and there's restitution. Let me explain the difference. Restoration is to bring back what is owed. So, for instance, if somebody owes you 30,000 and they give you 30,000, what has happened is restoration. But if somebody owes you 30,000 and then they bring back 30,000 together with a sum on top to take care of what 30, that 30,000 would have done if it had been it's called restitution. Restitution is full payment and making right for what went wrong. That's restitution. Restitution is saying, I recognize that I hurt you in not paying back or in not doing this. I'm not just going to do what I should have done. 
I will also do it the way God wants me to do it and repay fully what it would have been. That's restitution. It is making right. Then, number nine, be persistent and consistent. Be persistent and consistent. Healing requires persistence and consistency. And then, vent out your pain. Emotional integrity, vent out your pain. The people who want to be healed, but they don't want to cry. They say, oh, if Elias kuna madei. Alafu sasa kuna madei mwale kachapu na machali. Misi liagi. Misi liagi. Liacha. Yoni ya madei masufti. Nini ni mdei mwadi. I'm glad today we're going to talk about emotional healing. Praise the Lord. Vent out your pain. So when you begin certain things, you need to have what I call accessories around you. You need to have enough serviettes, you know, tissue, and you know, you need to have a pillow because sometimes you don't cry, you scream. When God is doing his surgery on your heart, there's pain, you will scream out. You will not be crying it out. You'll be screaming it out. Amen? Important for you to take note of that. Okay, uh, there was another slide maybe, yeah. Let me skip. Why some are not healed? Mm. Yes. There was a problem of dealing with a guy who prepares his own slides in his head. <laughs> Do you? You have that? Yeah. It's the next slide after this. Thanks. It's important for, for us to go through that. Why some are not healed? Lack of understanding. Yeah? Lack of understanding. You, people don't understand healing. Okay? They think that healing is a time when people fall down, then they come back up. And they're healed. You need to understand why people fall. Because the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon them. Lakini kuna wase pia wanguka tu. Sabu wase wengine wamedu, wamedunda. Lakini, if you let yourself go to God, he may choose to heal you when you are vertical or when you are horizontal. Do not concern yourself with God's choices of you, the position that he wants to bless you in. It's none of your business. Your business is to let go and surrender to God. Hallelujah. Yes. Nobody has laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit has come upon them. Don't concern yourself with how God wants to minister to you. He really wants to minister to you the way he wants to minister to you. However he wants to minister to you. Amen? If at that point the Holy Ghost comes upon you and you just want to kneel or prostrate, go ahead and do that. And just do business with God. Amen? That's what's important. All right. Um, lack of knowledge. Those two are different, right? Yeah, those two are different. Lo knowledge is information. Understanding is what? Insight. I am. Unbelief. Unbelief is refusal to believe. And believe ni, mtu na kuambia, maze God will heal, nasema mimi si believe. That's unbelief. Unbelief is different from disbelief. Disbelief ni mwona kitu mewa hapi, nasema, we, yo kitu mewa hapi nkweli. Wow, 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 wow. Hakini mewona eburudia yo kitu play rewind. Yo ni disbelief. Lakini unbelief, mse ya mekuambia mbaka mate imeisha. Webado kutu hapo, ayu, hizo ni zenu. That's unbelief. It is refusal to believe. Amen? Aya. Number four, refusal to repent. Number five, refusal to forgive. You see, all these are choices. Are you seeing all these are choices? Yeah, there's a choice to get into understanding. There's a choice to acquire the right knowledge. There's a choice to believe. There's a choice to repent. There's a choice to I attend the number six. Everything here is a choice. Pride is a choice to be humble. 
Okay? Self-pity. This is where most people are usually self-pity. They throw a pity party. They don't even know what, they are, what I was going through. It was so hard for me. <laughs> Nobody has gone through what I went through. <laughs> and I was just alone. People were just looking at me. They didn't want anything to do with me. Now, I'm not mocking anyone, please. Understand my spirit. I'm not mocking anyone. I am saying there comes a point where God takes pity on you because he has seen your suffering. But self-pity is refusal to deal. Most of the time is you say you, there is too much and I've covered it down here. Um, it's a twisted sense of uniqueness. Niwewe tu meenda through what you have gone through. Let me qualify this a bit. When you go through the hard things, niwewe tu unajua vile unafeel. So there I will give you, I'll grant it to you. It was tough. But I want you to know that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has come, has come upon you except what is common to man. Common to man means somebody else has been through a similar experience. That somebody else is not you. So they don't know how you feel. They can't walk up to you and tell you, I know how you feel. But they can walk up to you and tell you, I went through something similar. And this is what worked for me. Alright? If someone walks up to you and tells you, I know how you feel, please just dismiss that. That person doesn't know what they're supposed to be saying. But if they can, they can walk up to you and tell you, um, I've been through something similar and this is what I felt and this is what worked for me. This is how God ministered to me. So you are not alone in the things that God allows you to go through. You are alone, you are alone in how you feel and how you go through it, but you never go through it alone. Please understand this. The Bible says, says that Jesus was tempted in every point, yet without sin. I want to explain that. Jesus didn't go through every temptation. He didn't go through, but he was tempted at every point. So he knows what it means to be hungry. He knows what it means to be naked. He knows what it means to lack. Because the point is what is important. Not the circumstance. Not the abundance of situations. It is what? The question you must always ask yourself is what, at what point does suffering intersect with me and break me? When you find that point, God reached there before you through Jesus. He supplied comfort in that area before he allowed suffering to come. He reached ahead of you. So I want you to know Every point of your intersecting with tough situations, God left grace, comfort, mercy, strength. He left it there. Access it. Second Corinthians 1 verse 3. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our suffering so that we can Comfort others with the comfort he himself has provided for us. Let me explain comfort to you. The times Nairobi is very cold, right? All right? So um, the times when Nairobi is very cold and you're not married. <laughs> Same or two. Uh, you're not married. Um, the bed can get cold. So there is something you use to cover your cold. It's what? A blanket. And when you cover yourself with your blanket, now I'm not trying to be lewd. The Bible already says in uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, if two lie down together, they keep warm. So I'm just quoting scripture. It's there. You just... I can see your thoughts. <laughs> 
Eh? <laughs> anyway, um, so when you, when you cover yourself with a blanket, um, it shields you from the cold. So it changes the climate inside your body. Does it change the climate in the room? It does not. That's how comfort works. The room is full of suffering. The room is full of suffering. It's cold. But God left a blanket. It's up to you. Take that blanket and cover yourself. And it will change the temperature in your body. It will not change what's happening around the room. That's how you go through suffering. God's comfort provisions. When he applied, it doesn't matter how wild things get around. He'll come and do it. Man, <laughs> self-pity. Blaming others. This is refusal to take responsibility. Number nine is refusal to deal. People who just refuse to deal. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> then a twisted sense of uniqueness. Yeah, I've talked about that. Right. I'm looking at my time. Um, hmm. I need to be organized so that I see how to organize myself. Eh? I'm suspend my watch. I'm operating under authority. Is it Eunice or... Yeah, please come and advise me. Come and whisper in my ear. Because I, 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 I am a man under authority. I, I don't want to violate the space. Yeah, I have received instruction. Please turn with me to Second Samuel chapter 13. Second Samuel chapter 13. It's the story of Amnon and Tamar. You're very familiar with it, I suppose. And um, some things that happen to you when you get to certain ages and start playing, numbers start shifting and things. So I have to remove my glasses. <laughs> Second Samuel 13, uh, from verse 1. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he, came, he became sick, for she was a virgin. And it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. Now, Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to Hitamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to you, see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. Then Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight, that I may eat from her hand. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, Now go to your brother Amnon's house, and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was lying down. And she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked cakes. And she took um, the pan and placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie down with me, my sister. But she answered him, no, my brother, do not force me, for, such, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I... Where could I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not heed her voice, and being stronger than she, he forced her. 
uh, lay with her. And Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. So she said to him, No, indeed. This evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out, away from me, and bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace, my sister. Here is, he is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Please tell your neighbor, desolate. The word desolate means to be ruined and completely destroyed. To be ruined and to be completely destroyed. Tamar was shut down by this traumatic event. She was shut down. She never recovered from it. She never left her brother's house. She never received comfort. She never allowed herself to be comforted. She never related with anyone. She died while she was alive. took this thing to heart. It broke her into smithereens in her soul and crushed her spirit. Her spirit stopped living. Remember last week I told you the function of the human spirit is to what? Receive life and sustain life. That's where the codes of life are. They're in your spirit. When your spirit is crushed, it rejects life. Once your spirit has rejected life, it inadvertently gives an invitation to the spirit of death. Then people start to become suicidal. They start to say, I want to die. It would be better if I were dead. Death is a better option. They start to become obsessed. In this day when suicide is rampant, especially among people your age, I want to tell you what happened to Tamar. Let's go. Are you there? So, what are emotions? Emotions are centers of feelings. They're indicators of wellness or the lack of it. They are the engagers of relationships. You cannot be present in a relationship minus your emotions. That becomes a plutonic relationship that is stony. You know, have you ever been in a stony relationship? Hi, hi. How are you? Fine. You okay? Yeah. Story ime isha happen. Say you feel like you're hugging a tree because they are so hard. Because their spirit has rejected you. Your emotions are gone. They are the engager in relationships. There are receptacle. This is how we receive nurture. There are several things we receive from relationships. Pay attention to what I am telling you. There is a reason God puts us in relationships. It's so that we can be nurtured, it's so that we can be cared for so that we can be watered. We cannot be nurtured, cared for, and watered when our emotions are crushed because we have no receptacle to receive the nurture, the care, and the watering that comes from others. When you hug someone, it's not flesh meeting flesh. 
It is soul meeting soul and spirit meeting spirit. When you have when you have sex with someone, when you have sex with someone, it's not flesh meeting flesh. It is soul meeting soul. It is spirit meeting spirit. All the important things are in life are designed to be spirit to spirit and soul to soul. That's why you have soul mates and spirit mates. Because the connection is at a deep place. It's a receptacle. If you damage the receptacle, you have nothing with which to receive. You have no container with which to draw water. It's also the giving agency. So you don't just receive with your emotions. You also do what? You also give. All right, let's go to the next slide. Healthy emotions happen when people are full. And so when they are full, they give forth healthy emotions. What is to be full? To be full is to be fully nourished by the love of God in such a way that you have nothing to lose, nothing to prove, and nothing to hide. You put yourself out there with confidence. Because if anyone rejects you, you already have a place of acceptance. You work from a place of acceptance, never fearing rejection. You work from a place of love, never fearing not being loved. Because my father will always receive me. Psalm 27 verse 10. Even though my father and mother reject me, the Lord will receive me. Psalm 27 verse 10. So healthy emotions go out as follows. Love, joy, optimism, resilience, openness, confidence, glory, and wellness. These are positive emotions that we share. These are healthy emotions that we share when you're well. If you want to know you're well, take that list down. If you know you're well. You know that God has ministered to your emotions and you're full. You're not empty. Empty is when you are robbed. Relationships in your lives have robbed you, beginning with father and mother. Robbed. Some people never even knew their dads. They knew their moms. And I'm not apportioning blame to you or your mother. I'm just saying, even with your circumstance, you still needed fathering. You can argue all you want. It will never take away the need for fathering. It will never take away the need for mothering. If you had a father and the relationship was bad, you still were not properly fathered. If your mother and your relationship failed, you are not properly fathered. I'm not apportioning blame. I'm not blaming you. I'm not telling you to damage it. But you can be healed. Hello? Are we together? Okay. So, now let's go to the next slide. Unhealthy emotions. When people are empty, they give forth unhealthy emotions as follows. Hate. You know, you want to know you're unwell. This is glory. You don't need a hospital for this. You need the ministry room. You need the ministry room. Hate. Sadness. Negativity. Despair. Closedness. Fear. And shame. This receive anything. When people come close to you, you close down. Why are you coming close to me? Hmm? Guys get tossed over those, those big walls. You just hear a guy fly. And I just wanted to care for you. When people don't come close to me, you know, they don't. I had several close relationships and they hurt me. I don't want any more. There you are. Closeness, fear, shame. <laughs> Tama shut herself down. It didn't matter what Absalom said. He said, I'm hurt. 
I'm so aggrieved. She shut down. Let's go to the next one, slide. <sighs> this is what God created us to be. How this is how we were supposed to be nurtured. So seven things are supposed to be found in your family and in your primary relationships. Number one, say them with me. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number six. Number seven. If you fed on this, nobody can destroy you. Nothing can destroy you. You will bounce back from anything. It doesn't matter what it is. I diet on that. You're indestructible. You step out into the world and you lack nothing. Because the Lord has supplied you. And you have everything to give. And you're also able to receive. Praise the Lord. You can walk into any heartbreak and walk out. And you will be hurt, but you will be healed. Amen? Oh, yes, you will. Okay, let's go to the next. Um, wounding. So how does wounding happen? When these needs are not met, we get wounded in the following ways. Say it with me. And this is not necessarily a sin. This, let me pause there and explain. Ephesians 4.26, if you read the right version, ESV, RSV, New King James, they begin with the first statement. Be angry. <laughs> right? So, there's nothing wrong with being angry. But it says, the second part says, but do not but do not sin. In your anger, do not. So, this is when anger has become sin. This is not when you're expressing displeasure at something that you don't like. When you're doing that, you haven't sinned. But when you stay angry, we have problems. Second one is what? This is the destination of anger that has overstayed. It's called bitterness. Number three is what? Number four is what? Number five is what? This is Tamar. Anyone who commits suicide, this is them. Anyone who is on the verge of throwing themselves over something, this is them. How does emotional pain work? So you get wounded, you, it becomes very painful. You have that first stage called what? Then when raw pain doesn't get attention through healing, it goes to the next stage called what? You freeze it inside. Then when it has frozen, it goes to the third stage called what? Depression. And then we go to the fourth stage called what? So a lot of people come out of numbness and I said, ah, me, I'm fine. Ah, I'm dealt with it. <laughs> yeah? I moved on. In fact, that's the term people use. I've done what? So I usually tell people, 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 I Yeah, see, that was a long time ago. And I'm not even thinking about it anymore. So, you know, I mean, why should I still be crying about that? I was, I mean, I moved on. You did not move on. You went here. Na iko kwa store. Ta kona hiyo store sa hii. Hiyo pain iko kwa store. Aya, let's go to the next slide. We find the store. That's called what? Repression. That's the store. Works through a system called getting. Like a get. Getting. What is getting? Getting is the process that controls the perception of pain. Not the pain itself. But it controls the what? So the pain goes unattended. But the perception of it, I have moved on. Okay? 
Higher. Not the pain itself. By blocking the mass of electrochemical impulses that constitute pain. From doing what? From reaching the higher levels of the brain, which is where you will now start feeling conscious pain. Kuna mtu nimepoteza hapo hivyo? Unjaribu tena. Haya. So, this gate what it does it sees if the pain comes to your conscious mind you might break down because you don't have what the where with of all the equipping you're not equipped to handle the pain you have not been taught about healing you don't know what to do with it so what does it get to it suspends some things pam 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 so mecheswa your system has played you a number process that controls the perception of pain not the pain itself by blocking the mass of electrochemical impulses that constitute pain from reaching the higher levels of the brain let me give you a simple illustration of how getting works you go to exercise right if it is day one of exercise it feels good at some point it feels painful because your muscles are saying when in nini mbaya so the next day you're supposed to exercise again and your muscles tell you no but the gates decide we are going for this thing and we will silence the pain sindio now dig you we were hurt the first 10 minutes after that where did the pain go it was gated now that's in the physical good people we're talking psyche or let me explain a few words so that you're not so mesmerized by sometimes what people use the word psychology comes from the greek word psyche which means soul okay the word soma is the greek word for body okay and the word pneuma is the greek word for spirit so pneuma spirit psyche soul soma so when you hear somatic things musi babaike sana they're talking about your body <laughs> you hear talking about people are talking about psychological they're just talking about your soul when you hear people talking about oh si juu pneumatic hiyo ni spirit tu wanaongea juu yake let's hope they know what they are talking about amen haya basi so they it blocks you i right, attend the next let's go to the next getting separates thinking feeling and sensing levels of consciousness and controls input all the way along the nervous system so it ensures that that pain that you're supposed to feel so badly is numbed it's like an insulator it insulates you thoughts disengage from feelings then have a life of their own so you can begin to think and say i am well why the getting system has disengaged your thoughts from your what your pain lakini pain ipo still there okay let's go to the next this needs for me to go slowly but i don't have time so i'll just move how getting works it keeps feelings and sensations from the thinking level number 2 it prevents ideas and concepts from affecting our emotional level so you lose touch with reality number 3 the degree of getting is in proportion to the amount of pain So it's likely that Tamar because she went through so much pain in that rape ordeal she gated immediately and refused to deal and refused to allow anyone to access her That's what happens to people who go through a traumatic experience when they shut down this is what has happened to the next next one it 
allows only a bit of pain at a time into the consciousness. So, at some point, you will see something that resembles what you went through and just break down. And then people ask you, why are you crying? You say, I don't know. It just reminded me of something. What happened? A gate opened. How did that gate open? Through a trigger. It's okay. I got this. It opened through a trigger. The trigger was a similar looking event. Or somebody who resembles the person who oppressed you walks in and you just lose control. The gates gave way. Number five, yeah, we've said it allows just enough pain to be integrated and no more. So what you have in your conscious mind, oh, I went through so much. I wanted, at some point this happened. I don't even know how I went through that. Now you know. If the pain wasn't comforted, it was gated. And it allows you to remember just bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. So you can feel footsteps. If things used to be done to you when you were young, before you were five, you feel footsteps or smell a certain perfume, perfume or see something and then you start shaking and it's shaking out of control and you're wondering what's wrong. I remember that feeling. Why do I remember that feeling? The pain and experience were gated. Only a bit was allowed. Then you begin to reconstruct your memory. Not because you suffered amnesia, but because it was kept from you for your own good. Heavily gated people suffer from autoimmune diseases later on in life. People wonder where the cancer comes from. People wonder where the arthritis comes from. People wonder where the heart attack comes from. Here it is. Where the body turns on itself, begins to attack itself, we become allergic to ourselves. Is there any other slide? We develop large defense mechanisms. Pick any that belongs to you. Right, let's go to the next. So how do we heal? How do we heal? Acknowledge the wounding. Ask God to reveal. This is an important part. Because God will begin to reconstruct things for you. He'll bring scents. He'll bring sounds. He'll bring impressions. He will bring people that will remind you of experiences you never thought you went through. Journal your pain. Write it down. When you begin to write, pain begins to flow out. It comes, God pulls it to the surface. You begin to write, God begins to show you a movie. It's like a movie. Yallah. I remember now. I went through this. I remember. Hiya, where was it? Gated. It was in a gated community of pain. <laughs> Hello, are you there? May I understand the Imambo? I just mend Vent out your pain. If you must scream, scream. If you must cry, cry. If you need to be hugged by a father figure, look for a father figure and let them just hug you. If you need to hit them, Ask for permission to hit them. 
Sometimes that's what you need. You just need a guy who will let you heat them. You need to agree on the heating, okay? So. <laughs> Is somebody getting blessed here? Okay. I wanted us to understand emotional pain because a lot of times we imagine we understand. And then because most of us don't know what to do with emotions, we find that they're a bother. And why am I emotional? Have you heard of people saying, talking like that? They talk about their emotions as if they're such baggage. You know me, my tears are here. Yes, I thank God for you. Because there are some people whose tears are siju wea, uko kwa kiatu. They are far. Get dead. So if your tears are closed, please thank God for that. And people who usually have to <laughs> draw it with a deep container. Suppose Lee and Daga kuenda. Is God. <laughs> All right. Vent out your pain. Forgive, release, ask God to heal you and feel you. Is there any other? I think that's the last one. Thank you. We are done today. This is not the end of, of the teaching on healing. If you want to understand more on healing, you can take my number, 0722 uh, 499 You go should request your permission to also make the announcement because some people had asked me about a training that I'll start a training next Tuesday at 6 at St. Augustine. St. Augustine is next to Strathmore, so you take a Strathmore mat, a light next to Strathmore, ask for the All Saints Cathedral Primary School. We'll start at 6 to 7.30. Namsikose kujapa, Wednesday. Hello? Namsikose? Yes. This is just for those of you who want to explore healing. Because I, I was challenged last week, and they told me, I mean, you, you got so much, where are you going to take it? I said, yeah, you make a good point. So you want to understand healing? Come, let's uh, interact. But make sure you come here. That's one thing I've never done in my life is to steal people from people. Yogosh, I want you to know that. Yeah, I have no need for it. Yeah. Okay, so um, 0722 Call me, I usually pick calls. If I don't, text me and write your name. It's always good to say what you want. <laughs> Not being rude. Eh? Eh, yeah, no reverse calls, please. I'm to my WhatsApp. Praise the Lord. We want to pray. We have a few minutes left, so we want to pray. I want to guide us on how we are going to pray. Today we are merely going to begin the journey of emotional healing. There's a song I had asked for. I don't know whether the worship team managed to. Did you manage? Good. Okay, I'm going to come, call the worship team to come and just start playing that song. Um, as we play that song, the Holy Spirit is already here. So what he will do, as you let him, because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, as you let him, he will come into that place. That place where you are broken, like Tamar, and you feel desolate. He will come into that place where you've been feeling, for me, my life is over. I stopped living when this happened. Maybe you buried someone and you've never accepted they died. Or you have just, just, just this deep hunger in your heart. Father hunger, mother hunger, whatever it is. God has designed us with hungers. Don't be ashamed. Not having a father is not something to be ashamed of. It is something to take to God and say, God, you're my father. Amen? Please. Don't, don't, don't feel uh, stigmatized. There's no stigma there. 
it's a circumstance you had to grow up with. It's like I had to grow up with a circumstance where my father was not available from the time I was eight. And I grew up the rest of my boy and man life without a, without a dad. The further things I teach, God had to teach me directly and through other fathers who fathered me. Hey, guys, there is restoration. Amen? There is restoration. Please stand. And like last week, I just wanted to put your hands in a, in a receiving position. And open your heart to the Lord. Please say this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, today I choose to forgive those who have hurt me. I also choose to bring to you the nasty experiences I've had, the traumatic experiences I've had. I bring them to the cross. I ask you, Father, to cleanse me with your blood, to heal me with your love, and to fill me with your spirit. every dross. Jesus come. Pain will just begin to come to the fore. As it comes to the fore, let it go. Holy Spirit, heal your people. Heal them, O oh God. Fire of God. Jesus come. Oil of God. Begin to thaw. Oh, when the darkness fills my senses, when my blindness. Let's let go of that thing. 